uh, integrated health, uh, our current state of integrated health in the U.S., as well as discuss what exists within our networks and nationwide in relation to models of integrated healthcare delivery, as well as let you know about some upcoming opportunities that Catholic Charities USA would like to extend to the network. Um, in support of other additional initiatives to support populations that we are supporting. At this time, please mute your phone lines or computer speakers. You may use the chat feature for comments or questions during the presentations. And at the conclusion of the call, the lines will be open or unmuted at, uh, for the presentation of any questions. And all questions not addressed, or if we don't have time to address all your questions during the webinar, we will respond via email. In addition, we will provide continuing education credits of 1.0 for this hour that you spend with us today. So at this time, we're going to move forward into the deep dive. Please hang in there. And we will be recording the session today as well, so you can play back at your leisure, as well as there will be a PDF version of the presentation available to you. And you can see that in your, your window. OK, you ready for the deep dive? Let's head into the statistics. Hang in there with us. The current state of behavioral health in the US, one in 20 Americans suffers from serious mental illness. Access to behavioral health professionals is worse than for practitioners treating other illnesses. NAMI, which is the National Alliance for Mental Illness, identified a $1.8 billion cut in state mental health budgets during the recession that we experienced quite a few years ago. And can I say also that, that, that a significant amount of that cut was in case management services, which a lot of our agencies provide, and was so significant, as you can imagine, someone accessing medication as well as all the other services. That's a significant and really important element to the picture of serving people who are mentally ill. The severely mentally ill are being housed in jails and homeless shelters with a frequency mirroring the late 1800s. A few relevant statistics, I will not review all of these, but I do think they're significant in emphasizing the, the pertinence of our response to supporting integrated healthcare delivery across our network. The Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative provided the following uh, statistical data to highlight the benefits to integrating health within your system. 80% of people with a behavioral health disorder will visit a primary care provider at least once a year. 50% of all behavioral health disorders are treated in primary care. And those of us who are clinicians understand that this is a concern. 48% of appointments for all psychotropic agents are with a non-psychiatric primary care provider. 67% of people with a behavioral health disorder do not get behavioral health treatment. 30 to 50% of patient referrals from primary care to an outpatient behavioral health clinic do not make the first appointment, which that's where care coordination and care management is essential. Two-thirds of our primary care physicians report not being able to access outpatient behavioral health for their patients. And this is basically due to short, the shortage that we're experiencing nationwide of mental health care providers the health plan barriers that all of you are seeing out in your local communities, and the lack of coverage or inadequate adequate coverage, which were all cited by primary care providers as critical barriers to mental health care access. And here are some of the financial benefits of behavioral health integration. The use of health care services decreased by 16% for those receiving behavioral health treatment, while it increased by 12% for patients who were not treated for their behavioral health need, care needs. Depression treatment in primary care for those with diabetes had $896 lower total health care costs over a 24-month period. Depression treatment in primary care had $3,300 lower total health care costs over a 48-month period. Behavioral health disorders account for half of all disability days. So when we speak of disability days, we're, we're thinking of time off from work. So that's essential and that impacts all of us. 
annual medical expenses that includes chronic medical and behavioral health conditions combined cost 46% more than those with only a chronic medical condition. So we out in the field, the clinicians providing services, we understand the complexity of co-occurring disorders. Of the top five conditions driving overall health care costs, work-related productivity plus medical plus pharmacy cost, depression is ranked number one. We have an urgency to, to respond, and I wanted to share this Kaiser Health News report that was published on October 17th of this year. Uh, the, top, the title was, Scarcity of Mental Health Care Means Patients, Especially Kids, Land in the Emergency Room. This article noted that about 6% of all emergency department patients of all ages had a psychiatric condition. More than one in five were admitted, compared with just over 13% of medical patients and about 11% required transfer to another facility compared with 1.4%. About 23% of mental health patients stayed in emergency care for longer than six hours, and about 1.3% for more than 24 hours, compared with 10% and half a percent of medical patients. So this speaks volumes to us to share clearly that the patients that we're seeing out in the community and in our agencies are not properly treated in emergency rooms. So we, we have to consider thinking of partnerships with local hospitals and emergency room delivery systems so we can possibly partnership and triage those patients to the most appropriate level of care. The benefits of integrated care. The Stanford Social Innovation Review published an article that outlines the benefits of integ integrated care in alleviating unnecessary hospital and acute care admissions. The article reports that one in 10 young children under age 10 struggle with some form of mental illness. That was a pretty astounding number for me. Um, that was something I'd never considered um, as it relates to the perplexity that our children are facing in this day and age. Regardless of race or income, so this is not a race or income relevant statistics, this is across the board, it's a generalization. And only half will receive help because primary care physicians are not properly trained to identify mental health needs and are not integrated, meaning they do not have a behavioral health professional on site or accessible during routine visits. So uh, here in this case, we really are required to adopt a strong, uh, a serious, comprehensive approach to serving our populations. And I think that if we believe that this is all this research that, that Ramona has presented um, is, is out there in our community and our field and telling us we really do have to create a system that is uh, uh, something that our clients can have an easier access between physical health uh, and behavioral health. And then also because we're being faith-based, we also, I feel like, have an important role of discussing and, and considering spiritual health as well. So this is a really a clarion call for us that we must respond as Catholic Charities USA to these issues and how do we do that. And so uh, this is an important part, first step here in our uh, meeting that we had at the annual gathering, but also a significant first step in having this webinar this afternoon. So um, really I think that what we need to think about are the idea that traditional, standalone, one-on-one -on -one counseling programs really are, are, are not the wave of the future. When we think about where we're going, we need to think about the people that we're serving and what's going to be best for them is the, the concept of wraparound services. If you think about someone that uh, that the statistic mentioned earlier that over 50% of people that have mental health needs are going to their primary care physician, then uh, they're going to that. Think of the, the uh, terrible, a lot of times for a lot of our clients, the kind of climbing Mount Everest to get to if they make a referral to a behavioral health counselor. So if just imagine if all of that was provided in a co-located situation, that would, could be an amazing situation. So we're kind of looking at the, what's going on across the rest of the United States, that hospitals uh, and other systems are trying to do what they can to try to combine these services. So we're not looking at segregating, but we're looking at trying to combine all the different kinds of services so that we address the needs of the whole person. Also, um, we believe that, uh, well, we know that what we're seeing from research is the concept that probably folks that have non-credential um, uh, 
degrees or don't have a master's degree or don't have a license in uh, what they're doing really are not going to be able to be reimbursed or be able to provide the services at the level that our patients, our clients, our uh, beneficiaries will need um, to be able to be successful. So what we really need to do is what are we doing um, to uh, assure that our uh, population of uh, our workforce is strong and is uh, just, uh, I guess so, has the tool have the tools of evidence-based practice uh, to be able to do with the work that they're doing. Okay, then a big part of this uh, is the situation of reimbursement. That it used to be just always that people were paid uh, by volume rather than value. Uh, I see a client ten times in my practice or in our agency, and therefore we were reimbursed for those uh, those those ten times those that volume. I know like different places across the country like. Uh, some bill uh, per minute. I think like California, the Medi-Cal there bills for every two minutes of, of, of client contact, which requires a significant amount of, of uh, process recording. But you think about that, the idea is that I think where things are moving is that we will be reimbursed based more on value. Uh, how are we measuring what we do? And we have to employ uh, really quality um, uh, uh, measurement tools so that we can better indicate the impact that our work is doing uh, on the clients. So I think this metric issue is something that's important and that R Ramona and we will be talking more about and how do we help uh, our agencies provide better tools so that there can be an indicator that shows that we really are providing a significant value to our clients. So here are two models, basically, this concept of a patient-centered medical home and a Medicaid health home. So as you can kind of see there in the description of the two, uh, these are just two examples of, of, a, of a really uh, strong or robust tor sort of uh, uh, integration of, of med med medical health and, and uh, behavioral health. Really, a patient-centered medical home is where all patients are covered, no matter age or gender and all, I mean, all, all that kind of stuff. But it's led by the physician. Uh, the primary care provider is the leader in that concept. But there are multiple payers within it. It's team-based in that the, um, the physician may be interviewing a client in his or her office or interviewing a patient and, you know, considering all the medical aspects. And the client brings up that they're dealing with anxiety or depression, then the uh, the primary care physician could could call down the hall and bring in a, a, a psychologist or a social worker to be able to provide some sort of behavioral health intervention at that moment, and then be able to follow up with the person all there in a co-located facility. That's a, a great way to do it. And the payment that's reimbursed there isn't. Well, the doctor saw the patient. Period. But what is the value that's that's been added to the to the client? Um, how has the client improved? Uh, have they been able to, uh, maybe another situation might be a doctor that says, well, you know, your smoking is causing terrible heart stuff for you. Then we're going to act to get you to be involved in, a, in some sort of behavioral activation where you can reduce your smoking, and therefore that will improve health care outcomes. Medicaid health homes are a little bit different uh, in that they're primarily focused on individuals with chronic conditions. Um, and it includes a lot of mental health organizations, addiction treatment providers, um, and it's really Medicaid only. It's, it's team-based. Maybe they can be co-located or just referral-based or whatever, but they all kind of come, come together in, in this way. So that's a, bit, a little bit of a different type of Medicaid health home. This is just to show that there are different ways to integrate healthcare, everything from uh, if you ha if your agency has uh, an, an independent practice that's just behavioral health, you could go and reach out to a primary care physician, or you could go reach out to a hospital. There are different models for this that that, that we can play a role in this um, type of provision, this type of behavioral health integrated healthcare provision. If that makes sense. So there we go. Some overarching principles of this whole idea are the recovery model uh, here, this concept of, of moving away from a disease model towards a resilience model. So it's a very, very much about recovery. It's about hope. Um, it's about a belief that the person really can get better and that they're not kind of stuck with this. And we also view the person not as a diagnosis or not as, uh, you know, the, the reductionistic view that we often take in, in care is to say, look, here's a strong person. How can we develop this person? How can they come along and be a strong, stronger situation? And the recovery model does have different pathways. It's holistic. It's, it's very, very cultural humility is an important element in this. You know, I can never really be culturally competent in someone else's culture, but I can sure 
be willing to ask them questions and try to understand their culture and how that culture interplays with, with emotional issues as well as physical issues. It's because diet, uh, behavior, dress, all those things are included that do have an impact on our health and our behavioral health, our, our emotional health. I think another element here is that we must address and always be able to look at the issue of trauma. Um, this is a sort of a thing where we're kind of looking at uh, asking the person not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. So that we're considering always the awareness of, of what the issue that people have dealt with in their life. That's a big deal. And we also want to be able to address every patient with respect so that they are able to choose their own direction of care. That's a big deal as well. Okay, then uh, another thing here to be able to talk about is that uh, we've got some significant challenges before us. Um, really this idea of, of return on value is an important thing. How do we do that? How do we make that happen? And I think as a, as a network or as a community, we can definitely do that together. I think under the leadership of Ramona uh, here that we can be able to make, make this happen. We can get some good input from everyone in our network and be able to advocate and be able to support one another um, in this type of, of, of a movement. I think that another challenge is uh, moving towards more group treatment, um, really, that we, we, that's a better way to kind of uh, be uh, cost efficient and cost effective. And another issue is to uh, identify appropriate uh, measures. How are we measuring this? And what are we doing to, to, to uh, be aware of the, of the value increase in what we're doing? Oops. Ah, I mixed it up. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. OK. So you know what? I want to tell a quick little story about how I became aware of the concept of integrated health care. So my father. Um, uh, it was the greatest guy, but he had this, um, he had a mitral valve prolapse, which was this heart was leaky, le leaky heart valve. And so um, he went to the doctor, and he had, uh, then eventually led to the point where he had to have a bypass, uh, they had to, he had to be on a, a surgery to repair the leaky heart valve. Well, then during the surgery, they, they uh, put him on a bypass, which means the blood runs not through his heart, but through this little machine. And so um, this this was, it's a factor that, that is in, uh, heart surgeries. So uh, about a month after the surgery, I went over to visit my mom and dad. And Dad's on the back porch. He looks like he's just seen a ghost. He's like, he's got anxiety, really bad anxiety. So I'm like, wow, I wonder what's going on here. So um, my mom called the doctor and said uh, that uh, he, he had done this before. Called the doctor and said, well, you know, um, gee, the, let, he's having that little experience. Let's give him, tell him he can take a Tylenol. So my dad was experiencing really full-on panic attacks and definitely a generalized anxiety combination. Imagine what that was difficult for him. Well, but did they bother to tell their son who was in mental health services prior to a month out? No. Why would they have done that? But anyway, that's another story. The concept here is that if, if that doctor had known that 72% of people that have a heart surgery where they, their, the blood goes through a bypass, experience some form of depression and anxiety, then maybe that doctor could have referred my dad to a provider that could have helped set him up with some appropriate medication or maybe someone to talk to, to, to give him tools to be able to kind of step himself off the ledge there every time he started feeling that anxiety. This is, imagine what would have happened if there had been an integrated situation for my dad and things might have been a lot better for him during the months following the surgery. So. That's where I think that my eyes became open to this and then began to kind of look further into it and to discuss it a little bit further. And now we're at a point where Catholic Charities USA, among others, uh, are really looking at what's the best way that we can provide uh, services for our, for our people. So, so this, this uh, concept of, 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 of uh, what we're talking about here really it can't be discussed without considering the issue of social determinants of health. And I'm sure that many of you may be familiar with this, but basically the bottom line concept to it is that my health isn't just me internally, my blood, my genetics, my, uh, my molecules that are inside my body. It's me integrate, interacting with the social situation that I'm in, whether it's relationships and people that I'm uh, dealing with, or whether it's the physical environment, the larger environment in which I, I live, in which I, I am, uh, I'm engaged. So you can see from this, this slide here that uh, really the World Health Organization is beginning to pay more and more attention to this, that conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, really, I love that line because it just sort of is all-encompassing, and it shows how these external factors 
significantly play a role in people's um, life expectancy um, and uh, the longevity of, of, of folks because of all these issues. Okay, so here's a little graphic that we could look at to kind of, kind of talk about this. You see there, then on this graphic, the, the baseline there is health, our health. Our health, you know, can be all kinds of, of different aspects, but kind of focusing mostly on, on the physical health is the bottom line. And I think that we use the discussion of um, health as being sort of like life expectancy and quality of life, uh, ability to be able to do what you want to do and not be limited by physical constraints. So there's two components there that are real core to that, that grow from just that. That's medical care and personal behavior. And those two are kind of core there because they interplay so much. Um, medical care is only uh, helpful in so much as someone can be able to access it. And only someone can access the service only so much as they are free to do so. If finances are a barrier, if access is a barrier, um, if relationships and knowledge to what's going on is a barrier, then that keeps us from being able to provide the, the services that are, that are there, people having access to that. That's a significant determinant of health, is people's access. And on those different, uh, different factors, is my ability, my awareness, my access, you know, all those kinds of elements that, are, that, that, that connect to uh, personal behavior. Then you kind of go out that, to that next level on this graphic. You can kind of see living and working conditions in which we live. So if we live in a community that has poor water quality, or if we live in a community that has poor air quality, or if, there, if we're in a home that has lead-based paint that's never been detected. That's all that stuff is going to uh, really re relate to our health. It's going to be something that's important. Um, if we live in a, in a situation that's consistently stressful, if there's abuse or violence or in the home, that's going to be definitely impactful to the children in the home. That's a big deal. Then you kind of step out a little bit larger and you look at economic and social factors. Um, uh, you, know, they, you think about someone who's living in poverty, uh, that they have uh, maybe for some reason have a lack of education. That's a, that's a difficult thing for people to deal with. In fact, um, consistently uh, over all, a lot of the studies about the social determinants of health, it seems that education seems to rise uh, continually as a major uh, part of, of, uh, of uh, kind of a disadvantage. Uh, you think about people that don't complete uh, high school or don't complete co uh, at least some portion of college, uh, those folks that aren't completing high school have many more uh, negative health outcomes than those that have high, higher levels of education. That's a consistent message. In fact, if, if I was standing here and I offered you, um, you know, a million dollars or a college degree, um, you know, we're tended to take, we just want to take the million dollars, but that's going to go away. But the, the degree is going to be a much more valuable thing for any individual uh, uh, pertaining specifically to the elements that we use to measure health, um, you know, as far as uh, uh, life expectancy and longevity. So those are, all this kind of comes together that we can't ignore and just say, here, I'm going to give a pill for this symptom. We've got to kind of back it away and look at all those different aspects. Okay, so here's just another way, another element or another way to look at that same thing, uh, looking at, at a, from a larger picture. Uh, when we talk about uh, racism, did you know that uh, three to one students, uh, African-American students to white students are more likely to not complete, um, uh, to be dis uh, expelled from high school? four to one to be more likely to have repeated times of uh, where they're not expelled but uh, put out of school, you know, uh, uh, suspended, where there's suspension. Four to one more likely to be consistent expen uh, ex suspensions rather than uh, uh, white non-Hispanic students. So you can just kind of see that these things play a, a, a significant impact on um, our clients. So a couple things, a little bit, a few more statistics here. CDC estimates that about 10% of premature mortality is really due to inadequate health care. People aren't getting access. This almost 100%, 98% of health care dollars are uh, for health care rather than prevention. Think of the role that we could play to save uh, a lot of money and a lot of angst and a lot of suffering if we were focused on prevention. And we'll see a slide on that here in just a second. Um, so here, here it is. Here's the slide. Uh, so we're saying that, uh, that you can kind of see this little picture, this deal about if we're addressing the social determinants of health, if we're doing something up above to sort of talk to people about just even think about the concept of smoking. 
here's a person in a situation, they don't have the knowledge or the awareness of what smoking does to, to you physically. Um, there's anxiety and depression and sadness, and smoking helps the person calm down. Their parents smoked. They live in a family that smokes. It's part of the deal. But if we were able to intervene up at the top of that thing where those little people are and say, hey, look, here's some things. Here's some things you can do to reduce your stress. Here's some other ways that you can socialize around, things you can socialize around. Address it up there rather than going up to that uh, dropping off down to the deep there and ended up in an emergency room because you're having uh, asthma attacks repeti repetitively. Um, think how expensive that is to have to take the ambulance to go to the emergency room. That costs the hospital money. It costs the family money. It costs the individual money. So we kind of look at this thing of primary prevention. What role are we playing there as a system? Then we think about the safety net there, that kind of secondary prevention. But, uh, and then that, that, that tertiary prevention it seems to be where we're spending most of our dollars and a lot of our energy. If we can back it up there and look at the primary prevention, that's another significant aspect to the picture of integrated health care. So, all right, then we'll let, talk about a couple of other things from this previous slide. Um, let's see, um, if we've got increased differences in access uh, based on deductibles and co-pays, um, that's another significant element that's tied to finances. And then we kind of mentioned this earlier, but did you know that 40% of primary care physician visits are because of behavioral health issues? The primary care physicians are the psychiatrist and the counselor and the primary care physician to many, many people in the United States. So that's a, a, a really big thing. And just think, if we had a, an actual therapist or a behavioral health expert in the primary care physician's office, just think what we could do to improve the overall picture for many of our clients. So here we go. This, is, this brings us to my role as Chief Health Integration Officer, and I'll provide a brief overview of what I will be providing um, for all of the agencies nationwide. Um, we'll be facilitating network-wide training in the form of webinars, and this is our first debut, teleconferences, and future regional and or face-to-face -face meetings, assist in the generation and adoption of evidence-based practice tools for data tracking, measurement and care planning to include financial analysis and program viability assessments on site for each of your agencies. And Father Rakin briefly mentioned this uh, previously. I'd also like to um, engage member agencies in the communities of practice model to serve in an advisory role to support network efforts and to provide subject matter expertise in the initiation of integrated health and behavioral health as, as adopt an adoption uh, model across uh, all of our agencies. Advocate on behalf of agencies to include active participation in policy analysis, impact, and assessments while communicating the potential impact of legislation relating to our work. And we will be doing lots of that in the upcoming weeks and months as we are making this transition as a country. Uh, I will provide guidance and preparation to initiate community partnerships and co collaborations with healthcare providers. I'm also available for individual on-site consultations and training as requested. Here I provided a few examples of integration in Colorado and Michigan. I don't want to go through all of them, but they will be uh, included in your PDF that you can access at any time. But just to give you some ideas of, of various models that can be utilized, uh, the Spanish Peaks Mental Health Center provides licensed clinicians at a school wellness center. And the services offered at the Wellness Center include individual group and family therapy. Just an idea. Uh, the PATH program employs one full-time master's level clinical social worker from the uh, Spanish Peaks Behavior Health Center. And they interface with Posada, an agency providing housing and supportive services and empower homeless individuals and families. And we have these models that are pretty much identical to these, but these are just examples. And we'll hear more about the models within our network in a few moments. Bi-monthly, a care coordinator from West Central meets with an emergency department manager and site liaison to identify high utilizers of emergency services and to strategize on how to help patients seek out appropriate care. This is what we discussed earlier, not necessarily a co-location model, but some type of consultative or a collaborative relationship with local uh, health care providers to provide that expertise that many of them are lacking and have difficulty accessing.
as providers. The Moreno Health Center is an integration of Peak Vista's adult medical services into Aspen Point's adult and rural services location. And many of us are located in rural communities and we have access to providers as well as our patient populations may not have transportation and experience all sorts of barriers to um, accessing services. So this is a model that assists in enabling clients to be seen by both providers at the same location, which is co-location, as well as allows them to establish a medical home. The integration readiness assessment tool here, there's a link to uh, this tool. I will not open it here. We did uh, present it at the annual gathering. But it's basically a, a resource for your agencies to identify what position you're currently in as far as readiness to integrate your systems. And it's sort of a, a, form, a formative model. And you can sort of look at your internal infrastructures, what resources you have on, on staff, as well as within your system and determine your readiness as it relates to going out and establishing partnerships and also establishing that IT infrastructure, electronic billing, all those things that are essential to healthcare integration. So this is just a resource for you to access at, at your convenience. At this time, we'll conduct a poll because we want to hear from you. Uh, please uh, utilize your computers to answer the questions. Give us a second to launch. There will be two polls, so please uh, share your information accordingly. One second. Okay, we're, we're seeing your feedback. Thank you for your responses. Funding is breaking away as a... Okay. Okay, we're, we're waiting to get 100% voting, so um, we're almost there. Hold on. This is very helpful information. Okay, we're at 85%. Uh, okay, we're moving forward. Almost there. Okay, the question is, what is the greatest challenge to health integration in your agencies? And we have, we're right, right at 89% now. And looks like the greatest is funding, which is 64%. We have thus far next is staffing. OK, we're at 89%. Thank you all. Uh, let me see. Let me just read it off. Thanks for your feedback. So we have funding as number one. Staffing is number two, 26% billing systems, 21% training, and 17% IT infrastructure. Thank you for that feedback. We will record this information and utilize it to uh, identify how we can support you. Next poll, what topics would be most helpful? Okay, what topics will be most helpful for future webinars? Please begin to weigh in at this time so we have an idea. And the communities of practice will assist in identifying topics as well, but we wanted to get your initial interest at this time.
Okay, you guys are moving along. Thanks so much. Okay, a few more seconds. Okay, we're at 87% participation, 89. Okay, we have 89% responses, and what we're seeing is you're interested in, uh, equally interested in integrated health, the basics, as well as state and federal initiatives. Great. Uh, those two are weighing in equally at the same interest level as well as 48% in negotiating payment agreements. Great. We'll be able to provide that support. And uh, fourth is workforce development. Great. And then lastly, advocacy. So great. Thank you so much for your feedback. We appreciate your participation and we'll utilize this information to appropriately support your needs. Future direction, health and behavior health community of practice. I briefly mentioned this, and, and this group will uh, participate in engagement and advisory across the network. My uh, desire and Father Reagan's desire is to have participation from all member agencies. If you can designate someone within your agencies to be a part of the community of practice for health and behavior health integration, it will be wonderful. Uh, that's just so that we can have a consensus as well as a group of subject matter experts to support each other and it, it provide consultative services. Please email your interest and availability to me at rivy at catholiccharitiesusa.org. Additional support for member agencies. There will be ongoing training opportunities to include quarterly webinars that provide opportunities for agencies to learn about concepts and models of integrated health care. We'll continue to discuss the topics that we've reviewed today. Also, we will have subject matter experts and presenters that are leading integration efforts nationwide participating on our calls. So upcoming webinars and trainings will be um, communicated via the same channel as, as previously. Federal, state, and or foundation funding opportunity announcements will be shared as well. We are working on establishing a, a one-stop communication platform to remain in contact with all of you, so uh, please uh, stay tuned because we'll keep you informed about that, as well as legislative updates and advocacy, which really is going to impact our work over the next few weeks and months regarding uh, what federal funding opportunities are available, how our states are positioning in this new health care and behavior health care climate. We're sort of hanging out to see what's going to happen and how it's going to impact us um, as a, a network, as well as on-site visits to provide training, capacity evaluations, and integrated model readiness assessments, and agreement negotiation support, which has been discussed previously. Here's a, a new opportunity that we want to extend to all of you and begin to think about it at your interest level as well because we want as much participation and, and engagement as possible. Uh, we are proposing a new group to support grieving women. Uh, we're seeking interested licensed clinicians to participate in a one and a half, two day training here at the national office in preparation of launching a new psychoeducational and spiritual support model for women who have experienced the loss of a child via miscarriage, stillbirth, live birth, infant death or illness, as well as women who have experienced uh, trauma in the form of rape, incest, or other forms of abuse. This group will enhance coping skills and promote health and well-being among participants. So interested uh, persons or agencies or clinicians, please send me your um, your information by email, and I'll keep you informed as this, pro as this project rolls out. Also, we need your feedback. We, we really need you to let us know what your statuses are across the network because it's 164 member agencies, and we, we want to get gather data specific to integrated health, what partnerships you have, et cetera as well as your, your workforce, who your staff is, who's credentialed, what services you're providing. So uh, to continue to, not continue, but to provide the most optimal support to all the agencies, we need you to respond to two brief surveys 
uh, that you have or will receive via email over the next few weeks relating to behavior health program structure and existing and our future collaborative partnerships. And thank you in advance for responding uh, to those surveys. They're very brief. We understand you're busy, but we also want to be well informed so that we can provide the support that you need out there um, in your states and communities. At this time, we'd like to open the phone lines to hear about integrated stories within integrated care stories and models within the Catholic Charities Networks. We have a few uh, agencies listed here. I'm not sure if we have representation from all the agencies listed, but we would like to solicit your feedback uh, regarding just give us, if possible, two brief minutes of the models that you you're adopting in your cities and your agencies, and um, if you have any potential partnerships that you're in um, discussions with. And I would also like to extend uh, an invitation to CC of Wilmington, who I believe they're on the Wilmington, Delaware. I believe they're on the call as well, and hope that they can share their stories as well. We'll open up the phone lines at this time. Please use the raise your hand icon so if you would like to speak and voice your question or feedback, I will um, I will unmute um, your line. Is anyone on the call represented from these agencies listed? Please raise your hand and let us know so that we can open your line to speak. Hey, Jeff. Hi, Ramon. It's Jeff Tyner from Maine. How are you? Good. How are you? Thanks so much for sharing your story. We look forward to hearing what you're going to tell us. Sure thing. Um, first, we're really excited because Sister Donna was with us last night for our 50th anniversary and had breakfast with us this morning, and I hear you're coming our way, so looking forward to seeing you. Oh, yeah. You. I can't wait. So, so. <laughs> for uh, folks, and, and I'm, first, I'm really excited about this kind of forum here to start really talking to our, to our colleagues across the country around where they're at in this development. Um, so one thing we've learned over the last two plus years with the behavioral health home model that we've rolled out here in the state of Maine is that people have done it very, very differently across the nation. Um, so real brief synopsis, we started about two and a half years ago, um, stage B, which is the behavioral health home side after the patient center medical home piece had rolled out a year and a half prior. Um, we started out initially with just the adults, and then this past spring we expanded to three other sites and also moved into the children's sector. Um, so including Portland, Augusta, Bangor area here in Maine. Um, an important piece, and Ramona and I had talked about this at the National Conference in, in Boston, uh, Maine unfortunately is not a Medicaid expansion state. So that has really um, had an impact on us in terms of service provision, but also how this is kind of rolled out for behavioral health services. Uh, we currently have close to 500 individuals that are enrolled in our behavioral health home services between children and adults across um, central and southern Maine. Um, we do not co-locate. Um, we do partner with multiple hospitals and um, federally qualified health centers as our MOU partners, which is required under the state of Maine uh, for us to be able to partner. One of the greatest benefits that we've had, um, and it was a part of our award ceremony last night, we have a health information exchange called Health InfoNet in the state of Maine. Um, that provides a single hub of communication and tickler alerts for the clients that we have in our behavioral health homes. Our workers get an immediate notification of anyone in an emergency department or inpatient setting. So we're really able to utilize data and technology and leverage that towards really meeting the needs of decreasing our clients' um, you know, challenges and, and visits to those high-cost acute settings. Um, I don't have the statistics in front of me, Ramona, and I'll just wrap up with this. Um, so we have seen over the last two years probably a 50% decrease in emergency department utilization um, and similar numbers around um, inpatient. So we really have some fantastic outcome measures both in terms of quality of life, cost savings, and engagement for clients to look to as we continue to expand and really leave the quarter hour fee-for-service 
behind because that's being really um, almost exterminated here in the state of Maine through a whole bunch of regulatory pieces. So that really is the direction we're going. So the PMPM -PM model for us is working, but it's been uh, building the plane as we're flying it. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jeff, for sharing your story and, and all the amazing work you're doing there. Okay, Dr. Rob. Robert. Hey, Rob. Ramona, are you talking to about Bob Nero? Hi, yes. From Hartford. How are you? I am well. Hello. How are you? Great to have you on the call. Great to be here. Yes, we want to hear about the work you're doing there in Hartford. Amazing stuff. So real briefly, um, we have uh, eight behavioral health uh, traditional behavioral health centers um, that uh, about 70% on average Medicaid reimbursement. Um, we have general outpatient behavioral health, which we, you know, we bill for, obviously. We have a multitude of grant-funded programs. Um, and in the state of Connecticut, um, the, the primary care practice opportunities and the FQHCs, um, the, the wagons have been pretty well circled. <laughs> And, uh, and, and those entities here in the state have, uh, have pretty much um, already uh, developed their own integrated models. And so we're looking at, um, at, at, at right now, two general um, avenues. Um, one of which is we are developing a memorandum of understanding and a collaboration with an FQHC lookalike. Um, with a, uh, a sister company whose history was grounded as a nonprofit uh, behavioral health and substance abuse treatment program, uh, but they've gone ahead and taken the leap uh, to include primary um, care. So uh, we're exploring ways to uh, uh, kind of identify whose expertise lies in what realms and um, how we can cross refer to one another. Uh, the second uh, opportunity that we're exploring is with a uh, Catholic-based hospital, St. Francis Hospital, which is located about uh, a block and a half from us, near part of the Trinity Health Network. Um, we've just entered into conversations with them about uh, ways in which we can um, strengthen our collaboration. We already have a, a very thorough knowledge of each other and, and what we do, but I don't know that we've really maximized that, particularly in preparation for this um, this integrated um, movement towards integrated and, and uh, global payment uh, methodology. So that's where where things sit up here in uh, cozy Hartford, Connecticut. Thanks so much. We appreciate your time and all the wonderful work you're doing there. Robin, are you still on the call? Else. Those are two pretty great examples. Robin. Robin, what's Hold on one second. We're trying to get to you, Robin. Okay, looks like your pen, you haven't answered your pen, Robin, so we're not able to hear you. You want to type in your question? Or comment. Or comment. We can respond that way. Oh, thanks, Robin. We saw you know. Thanks so much. And thanks for being on the call. Anyone else want to share your stories of integration? Fritz Jones. Hi, Fritz. So you're on? Fritz, can you hear us? Fritz, can you unmute your speakers, please? Okay, we can't I can't hear it. Okay, can you hear me thank now? you. Yes, yes right. thanks. <laughs> um, 
Brett Jones from Catholic Charities, Wilmington, Shamlin, McLaren, our behavioral health uh, managers with me as well. Our, uh, it was funny to hear the, uh, the comments from Hartford because it was almost deja vu. We are actually also working with the local Catholic hospital, St. Francis of Trinity Healthcare in Wilmington. Um, we're, we're partnering with them and uh, it's getting closer to fruition. We actually have just been submitted, uh, picked as a finalist for a grant that's going to allow us to go out with St. Francis Hospital's current very popular medical van program that provides health uh, and medical care to people in different parts of the city uh, of Wilmington, very underserved areas, very poor, a lot of uh, Hispanics. We're going to actually be partnering and going along with them in a second vehicle to provide a variety of uh, supportive social work services, including uh, we expect behavioral health services. So, so it's, uh, we're excited about it. We also are looking at the opportunity to expand that outside of the city limits into very underserved rural parts of our diocese, particularly in the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, another thing we've done that we haven't quite begun the, the integration process with, but we hope to, is we've started using telepsychiatry as, a, as one of our tools. And uh, we've had some success with that, some challenges as well, but success. So those are the kinds of things that we're working on right now. Thanks so much, Fritz. We appreciate that information. Amazing work happening right within our network. You know, you can just kind of, you can kind of hear, I feel like, kind of a range of things that, like, some of it's just reaching out to the local hospital, which is something that Ramona can help, any of us, or either of us, could help with, uh, sort of like, well, how do we communicate that, and what do we do for that, as well as all the way to the extreme of very, very complex stuff with the tele telehealth. That's pretty awesome. A good, good breadth of stuff. Hi, Jeff. Did, did you have another comment or question? Yeah, actually, the, the gentleman just started picking up on, on what I was sending, and I do apologize to everybody across the country for my poor typing skills. Um, <laughs> but it, it, had to do, it had to do with telepsychiatry. I know from talking to other folks that I do know in other states, um, and Maine is absolutely no different. In fact, we might be even more, uh, have more of a pinch up here than elsewhere, is, is there's a profound lack of psychiatrists, both specialists um, for, for kids and for adults. And that's one of the things I think we had tabled in Boston was really would like to explore. Is there any chance if we can get through the regu regulatory hoops by state and such to, to create some kind of, of, of base of telepsychiatry that we can all utilize to support these services in rural areas? Um, our our rate-setting process here in the state of Maine is absolutely dismal, and it's going to be another legislative fight this year to try to work through a rate-setting process. So. Anything like that where we could create efficiency as a larger organization would be fantastic. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jeff. The survey. Here's a question. Does the survey ask about telehealth um, utilization across members? The survey does. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Also, uh, Fritz, if you're, if you're still on the call, would you briefly discuss uh, your dynamics with psychiatry there as far as credentialing across states? Fritz? I'm going to turn it over to Shamla because she's got the best experience with that, but yeah, we'd be glad to answer that question. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, hi. I'm Shamla McLaurin. I'm the Behavioral Health uh, Program Manager here. Um, How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Great, thanks. Um, so the, the credentialing process, it, it has been challenging. Um, just the state of Delaware, you know, they, uh, and I'm sure every state probably requires similar things in terms of just getting the fingerprint done from another state to here. <laughs> it's kind of a long process. Wow. Um, and, you know, all the, all the DEA clearance for, to write con for controlled substances, um, licensing, those sorts of things. So it can take a little while um, because each each thing that's required takes a different amount of time. Um, okay. once, the, once all the materials gets in, then the act, acquiring the actual license to go ahead and start practicing happens very quickly, but it's just a matter of getting those materials in and cleared through the, the federal and the local, the police, all those different um, entities. So um, that part is a little challenging. Um, you know, right now there's this big initiative to um, kind of shorten that, I forgot what it was called, I don't know if it can remind me, <laughs> to, um, though the interstate compact, that's what it's called, I'm sorry, 
So this, this whole initiative regarding interstate combat to kind of help um, um, physicians and nurses that are involved with telepsychiatry get licensed a lot easier and a lot quicker. Um, that, you know, from everything I've read, there's some talk about that, maybe some legislation that's going to be put forth regarding that. So um, that would be awesome if that happened because it would cut the time that you could actually find someone to hire and get them working probably in half. So okay. um, we're, we're keeping an eye on that, but just the normal processes, they, they can take a little while. There have been. Our, our first foray into this, we did have for a while a uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner and um, most of our insurance providers accepted the way that we were going to supervise that and, and uh, because uh, they have to have a psychiatrist overseeing their work so many hours a month, I believe. And mm. uh, one of our largest insurance providers did not accept that model and would not reimburse. And we were, we were working with them, and we still are working with them to address that. Unfortunately, our nurse practitioner moved on. Uh, to more full-time work, and so we're replacing her and vetting another person. So there, there are challenges, but when it was working and she was with us, we were able to provide this service. Our clients liked it. Um, it was cheaper because it was a nurse practitioner, and so we have, we're really optimistic that once we get this thing moving and find the right person and they stick around, it's going to be a real great add-on. You know, the interesting thing is, in our case, you would think the nurse practitioner or the, the telepsychiatrist or, or telepsych nurse practitioner would be serving by most rural areas in the Diocese of Wilmington. It's actually the reverse. She was helping us in our metropolitan area of Wilmington because we can't, in the big city, find a psychiatrist not busy enough to give us some hours. We actually have our rural offices covered by a, a, a psychiatrist um, that provides us with a lot of time. So it's just a dynamic challenge. Uh, I know some of you, it was a rural thing. For us, we can't find anybody in, in the most populated part of our diocese. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, at this time, we're going to wrap up the presentation. This is my contact information. Uh, it, you'll have access to the slide, to the PowerPoint presentation via PDF. So please feel free to send any questions or uh, call me to schedule a time so we can um, chat further. And I look forward to visiting and speaking with all of you more, and we're going to keep the line, open the lines, actually, so that we can address any final questions. We have three minutes uh, to address any final questions uh, before we. But we're willing to. But we can we can expand our time. Um, but those of you who need to disconnect, uh, we apologize, but this is very uh, interesting topic today, and we want to hear from all of you. So this time we're going to open the phone lines for any questions, or you can raise your hand and we'll unmute your line. I guess so we won't have all the feedback noise. We'll just do one at a time. So if you have any questions or comments, please raise your hands at this time, and we'll unmute your lines and allow you to speak. David. David. David, we're, we're unable to, we need you to add your pen so we can unmute your speakers because we can't hear you unless you want to type your question. That, that'll work as well. Jeff, do you have a, another question or comment? Yeah, I, I actually have a friend. Yep, I was just going to say it's so good to hear Father Reagan's voice and, and to hear you, uh, Ramona. We're really looking forward. We're very, very excited about this forum here. and. Um, and hopefully we'll have some, some luck with the psychiatric piece. Unfortunately for us, they're actually looking in the state of Maine of removing mid-level practitioners from the ACT team regulations, which is going the complete opposite direction, which puts us further behind the ball. So time is of the essence for us, so we're excited about being able to join with our colleagues. So thank you very much for hosting us. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Jeff. Thank you. Take care. You too, Jeff. There, David, there, David. David, are you hey. on? Hi. I'm on. <laughs> Yay! Thank you. <laughs> Made it. Uh, yeah, I'm just I'm just so happy to hear you live, and uh, and so glad that this is moving along. Um, nice to hear. Uh, I was just going to comment for us, uh, our diocese is about 100 miles from tip to tip, roughly. So big geographic area, and we found uh, getting folks from whatever program they're in. We have about 35 of them 
for mental health services, we ran into the same problem you alluded to earlier, about a 30 to 40 percent failure rate for the first appointment. So we okay. turned that around about six months ago, and we now provide on-site consultation. So I have one of my staff uh, go to the programs for about four or five hours a week, and when they go there, they can see people or consult with staff, and uh, that's made a big difference in people actually getting help. So wonderful. I'm in around. Yeah, just have many ways to go about all this. So exactly. That's that's great feedback. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you for having us. Thanks, yeah. David. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Be sure to look out for the survey that is going to come. And if maybe you have already received a survey, you will uh, be sure to be sure to um, respond to that one. Well, there will be a survey sent to all participants today regarding the webinar mm -hmm. at the end of the call today. But we also need your feedback on the other surveys that we discussed earlier in relation to your behavioral health capacity as well as your existing partnerships and other specifics regarding staffing, et cetera. I promise they're very brief. Uh, we understand that you're busy, but we do need the feedback so we can plan and support you accordingly. And again, if you're, if anyone's interested, I, I have some response regarding the support group for women. Please send me an email as soon as possible so we can begin preparing to support the clinicians that will come and participate here in uh, Washington, D.C. and learn about this exciting opportunity to expand uh, your skill set in a, a different evidence-based practice group training model that I think you'll all be very excited about as well as to support women who have experienced uh, the losses and grief and traumatic uh, incidences that we've described. Hey guys, too, we, uh, if you are interested in getting a continuing education credit for this um, hour, uh, please email Ramona, because that's the only email that's that's listed, and she'll forward it to me, and then we'll we'll get be sure to get you what needs to be done for that. But we have to do a little bit of an evaluation to uh, you have to respond to an evaluation so that you can get this continuing ed credit for this. So this could be a one hour uh, uh, CEU. Thank you all for your time. We see no other no further questions. Let's see. Okay, you want. This is Renee. Okay, I'll we'll relist the email. My email. There it is. Okay, it's R I V Y at CatholicCharitiesUSA dot org. If there are no further questions, thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of the day and week, and we look forward to connecting again soon. And thanks for all the work you're doing across the U.S. Thank you all, and thanks to Ramona for setting this up and doing this. We will share the PowerPoint. Thank you.